Good morning. morning. Everybody good? Anybody get healed today? I hope and I pray. Yeah, we believe. Uh, How you guys doing? Yeah, good. All right. Dr. Cowden, you good? All right. I'm just checking out everybody. Okay. Got a really cool sermon this morning. A really cool title. One of the coolest titles I've ever had. Python, Prison, Praise, Prayer, Praise, and Purpose. Let me say that again. Put that back. Go back. So I can see it. There we go. Python, Prison, Prayer, Praise, and Purpose. Okay? And I, and I thought, okay, that's... You've heard of two peas in a pod? This is five peas in a Paul. I've been talking about Paul this morning. Erupting in laughter. Man, they just went over like a... Come on, someone, come give me a holy laugh this morning. Wasn't that funny? Five P's in a poll. Still, study, uh, still going on this series uh, after Pentecost because after we had the resurrection Sunday and then we go, all right, what, what happens after the resurrection? Well, there was uh, 50 days there before the Holy Spirit came and Pentecost fell on Pentecost. And we said, well, what happens after Pentecost? So I've been teaching on that, all the things that have been taking place after Pentecost because, guys, if we just get saved and nothing happens after that, what, then we just get baptized in the Holy Spirit and we don't do anything after that. We're not proactive. We're not moving forward. Then we just kind of get stagnant. Anybody ever get stagnant in your walk with Christ? I mean, everybody has it one time or the other. Uh, usually, you know, the best way to know if you're stagnant with your walk with the cross is like, I just don't hear God talking to me anymore. You know, that's usually, I just feel dry. Everybody get, anybody get that way? So we have to do some things. The God, God, He didn't just say get saved. He said, He says, faith without works is dead. You've got to do some things. It's all the Bible's all about fulfilling some things. He said, "I'm giving you this promise," but there's a lot of times that with a promise, it's qualified with the word "if." If if you will do such and such, if you will draw near to me, so we've got to do some things. We've got to be proactive in our faith. And some people go, "Well, I just want to get saved and go to heaven." Well, that's cool if you want to get saved and go to heaven. But I'm telling you, it's better if you get saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're actively bringing other people with you to heaven. Because if you're just stagnant, you're not gonna. Nobody's gonna want to know you're Jesus if you're just one of those old Christians. Just, oh, this God is so good. I just can barely get out of bed. This word, God is so good, isn't he? Yeah, I sure want to know you're God. <laughs> no, but you want to. We need to be active in our faith. So this morning, you know, after you after you come to that place of being saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, you should start thinking differently. You should start looking at situations differently in your life. You should start looking and and viewing things from a heavenly perspective. The Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That means, to me, that means we have a different perspective. We have a different viewing seat, right? So we see things differently. So as we, last week we talked about Peter being in prison and the angel coming, knock him in inside and said, get out of there, right? We talked about that prison experience last week. This, t- this week we're going to talk about a different prison experience with the Apostle Paul and Silas. Many of you heard this story, but I want to back it up a little bit to show you why they got into, thrown into prison in the first place. The, the thing is, Paul wrote this amazing verse, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Romans 8.28. Most of you can probably quote it. A lot of you will misquote it, Okay. But we're going to read it from the New King James. I'm going to read it from the Passion. Romans 8, 28. Apostle Paul. And we know that all things, say all things, work together for good, for good, to those who love God, to those who are the called, the called according to His purpose. How many of you have ever heard that? All things work together for the good. No, they don't. (laughs) Tell me about that one. You have to read these in, in you have to read it in the in the context of it. He says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I love the tra- the passion translation says this. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his designed purpose. Say his designed purpose. See, we have a design. Sometimes we have a design what we think we should do. This is how we should live life. And then God says, no, no, uh, 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 that's not the right design. I've got the ultimate design. I created you. I have a destiny for you. And it's a divine destiny. We have to get in line with that if we're going to live this life and walk this life and and, and impact the, the world for the kingdom of God. Because right now it looks like the world's winning, doesn't it? So we've got to rise up. We've been hearing that ever since COVID started. Church got to rise up. Church got to wake up. Well, we really do. We've got to come to the place where we go, 
It's important what we believe. It's important what we speak. It's, import it's important what we do every day in our lives. We've got to affect the culture around us. I don't know about you, but this verse means a lot to me. Every Christian should love this verse. All things work together for the good to those who love God, who, the, who are the called according to His purpose. Because then you can look back at your life and go, man, that was a bad time in my life, but God worked something good there. Man, that, that was a horrible experience that I went through, but God worked something beautiful out of that. He, he, what the enemy meant for bad, God turned for good. How many of you can testify to that this morning? You've been through some stuff. You've been through some things. And all of a sudden you find, man, that looked bad. It looked like it was a dead end. It looked like there, there was no place to go. My back's against the wall, and God comes to the rescue. He says, let me turn this, this thing that looks ugly in your life, let me turn it for, your, for my good and for your glory, for the glory of God. So we have these things. How many of you have ever been betrayed? How many of you have ever been walking through some really difficult times? How many of you have ever been in trouble for doing something good? All of us have been through these things. So we need this scripture this morning. That's, the, that's what I want us to hone in on. Because when we look at what Paul is going through, then he, listen, he more than anybody had the right to write this scripture. And say, I've been through some things. But God worked them out all for His glory, for my good. God's looking out for you this morning. Say, God's looking out for me. Okay, so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16. It's really four points, but I've got five Ps, so I don't want to confuse you too much. The first point is Python. So then that's an interesting subject title, Python. Okay, let's just read the Scripture. Now this is from the Passion Translation, and this is the, uh, the events are told by who? Who wrote this book? Luke, 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 Luke. Say Luke. Okay, all right. Didn't mean to throw you off there. You know, I hate it when people, they, they do that and you get the wrong answer. You go, oh. yeah, missed that one. Okay. One day as we were going to the house of prayer, we encountered a young girl, a young slave girl who had an evil spirit of divination, the spirit of Python. Uh, it's also a witchcraft spirit, okay? She had earned great profits for her owners by being a fortune teller. She kept following, she kept following us shouting, these men are servants of the great high God, and they're telling us how to be saved. That sounds really good, doesn't it? Okay, we'll see about that. Day after day, she continued to do this until Paul, greatly annoyed. How would you like to annoy Paul? Greatly annoyed. He turned and said to the Spirit indwelling her, I command you in the name of Jesus, he anointed one to come out of her now. And at that very moment, the Spirit came out of her. Are demonic spirits real? Or, or, or were they just delegated to 2,000 years ago? How many of you know the demons are real today? You say, yeah, you should know. You should see my wife. <laughs> oh. oh, I just, just funning with you. Just seeing if you're listening. Or husband. Or... How many of you know somebody's been demon-possessed? How many of you have been demon-possessed? <laughs> yeah. It's real. Demonized. Okay, well, let's just get technical. Demonized or been harassed, harassed by a demon. Anybody been harassed by a demon? See, demons are real. Uh, the Bible teaches that demons are real. And we deal with them in this church every week, every month. I mean, people come here. They may not go to any other church, they may, but they'll come here because they say, man, I've got to get rid of this demon. I've got, or demons, or plural, whatever it is. Demons are real. Evil spirits are real. Witchcraft spirits are real. real. The Bible talks about them through and through and through. And in the New Testament, after everything was done, everything, after Pentecost, they still had to deal with demons all through the New Testament. So they're real, right? So we need to know that we can deal with those and God gives us the power over these demons. 2,000 years ago they were real. 2000, today they're real. And this young woman, listen, this woman, see, the enemy comes to pervert people. He comes to, he steals your, he wants to steal your anointing. He wants to steal your gifting. And apparently this young girl was probably destined to be a prophetess of God. You understand that? Because giftings come and the enemy will always try to counterfeit or steal the giftings that God's already got for you. So you may be gifted in a certain area, but the enemy got a hold of you at some point, and all of a sudden you're doing these things for the enemy and not for the, not for the kingdom of God. So the, the gift has been perverted. So what's happened in this young lady's life is this gift uh, of prophecy has been perverted, and now she's working for guys, and she's a fortune teller. Now I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you've been to fortune teller, but I dare say many of you have been to fortune teller. I Probably some of you have done that 888 psychic, and you've called somebody. Listen, these, are, these entities are demonic. 
You don't need to participate with those. And if you have, you need to repent of it. Fortune tellers, horoscopes, all these things, Ouija boards, all that. It's, it's real and it's demonic and you don't need to participate with it. So this lady was participating. Now she was earning money for her pimps. They were pimping her out as a fortune teller. That's basically what they were doing. They were making money off of her, Beto. So, hey, if you can read their fortune. And so here she's going along and she's saying some things like, hey, these guys know the way to salvation. Now, I've studied that scripture many times. How many of you have looked at that and go, what in the world is she talking about? We're, she's got a demon, a python spirit. Now, guess what? Let me go back to python since I mentioned python. The enemy comes to prefer it, right? Who was the first enemy to come and how did he come? As a snake in the Garden of Eden. He was trying to pervert the purpose of God for Adam and Eve and he did a really good job of it, right? Okay, so then, so then God moves on past that and he brings us Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, the enemy thinks he's perverted that by nailing the Savior to the cross, right? But he failed at that, right? Because Jesus was resurrected. Praise God. He raised him from the dead. I remember the passion. Remember the passion of the Christ? And they showed the serpent in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I thought, what, the serpent? Well, yeah, that was a pretty good depiction. Hey, Jesus, you don't really need to go through with this. But he did, right? He said, not my will, but the Father's be done. So he went through it. God raised him from the dead. So the enemy gets beat again. He gets defeated again. So he comes again as a, as a serpent, as a python spirit. The Bible says a python spirit to try to pervert the gospel. Now, let me tell you this. I used to look at that verse when it says, oh, these, be, these, these men are showing you the a way of salvation. I thought, well, why is God, why is Paul upset that she's speaking the truth? You ever think about that? Well, maybe she was mocking them. Oh, these guys are showing you the way to salvation? Uh-huh, sure. Or they could have put a question mark at the end of that. These guys are showing the, us the way to salvation? See, there was no exclamation parts, uh, uh, points or uh, question marks in the Bible when it was originally written. So it could have been a different way, a different tone that she said it. But here's something I studied and I found out this week that really made a lot of sense. The enemy wanted to bring, present Jesus Christ through a fortune teller. How perverted is that? How perverted is that? You see, we have it today in the world. It's called New Age teaching. Are you understanding what I'm saying? New Age people, they'll say, well, yeah, Jesus is awesome. He is cool. You really need to know that guy. He's just awesome. He's a great prophet. He's a great teacher. And they'll tell you that Jesus is cool, that he's, Jesus is just all right with They'll tell you all that stuff about Jesus. But then you say, well, is he the son of God? Oh, well, we're not going to go that far. So what are they saying? They're saying he's one thing, but he's not another. Then that says he's a liar to them. Right? So we have this new age thinking in our world today. How many of you know it's real? It's prevalent. Go buy a crystal, hang it on your, over there, right there with your plastic Jesus on the dashboard. And you're good to go. Get, get all the things that you need to cover you. Listen, there's no other gods before him. So when you try to start mixing all these other false religions with Jesus, that's what they were trying to do here to pervert the gospel. From the get-go in a new region where the Bible, the Bible says they're coming into a new region and they're taking the gospel. So then it says several days. He waited several days to, throw, to cast the demon out. And I thought, well, why would you wait sev several days? Why would you just, why wouldn't you just cast the demon out? Because it says he was greatly annoyed by her. Well, think about this. The more public she became in front of all these people, and Paul was listening to it every day, the more public she became when he cast that demon out of that little girl, that young girl, the more public the power of God came. And the power of God said, I am greater than any demon spirit. So we, sometimes we say, oh, the demons are so strong. No, the demons are weak in, in, in lieu of God's power and God's grace and His presence. Listen, we, we, we don't want to give the devil any more power than we want to give him, right? We want to give God all the power and all the glory. So the python spirit is alive. It's in our country today. It's in our world today. But God's spirit is greater. God's power is greater. Second thing we see is prison. Number two, when her owners realized that their potential of making profit had vanished, they forcefully seized Paul and Silas and dragged them to the city square to face the authorities. And when they appeared before the Roman soldiers and magistrates, the slave owners leveled accusations against them, saying, These Jews are troublemakers. Well, they really were. 
They're throwing our city into confusion. They're pushing their Jewish religion down our throats. It's wrong and unlawful for them to promote these Jewish ways for, ways for we are Romans living in a Roman colony. Really, all they're saying is, he stole our money. That's really what they're upset about. A great crowd gathered and all the people joined in to come against them. And the Roman officials ordered that Paul and Silas be stripped of their garments and beaten with rods on their backs. After they were severely beaten, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them securely. So the jailer placed them in the inner, innermost cell of the prison and had their feet bound and chained. Okay, here's Paul. Y'all got this picture of Paul and Silas? We just think of them in the chains. But there are, first of all, they're, they were beaten with rods on their backs, on their bare backs. For doing what? Setting a girl free. Doing a good thing. Beaten. Bloody mess going into, then, then, then they're put in prison stocks. Then they're put in their feet or put into stocks. Then they are, they're in prison, they're put, the guards are put around them. After all that was done. And then Paul's thinking, and we know that all things work together for the good. To them that love you, Lord, and are called according to your purpose. See, he had to have that in his heart. He couldn't just, it just couldn't be a good little verse like we do it. It's, oh, that's a great little verse. No, he had to know it, that he knew it, that he knew it, that he knew it. Because of what he was about to go through, what he was going through. See, we get up and we complain about the, a, a, a hangnail. Oh, Jesus, heal me. We, we complain about, oh, somebody looked at me wrong when I said, oh, can I pray for you? Oh, we, we get so offended at people and God, God forgive. Forgive us for being so weak when we and we fail and we crumble when men of God like this were being beaten for the gospel. They were being put in chains for the gospel. And then they were saying, all things work together for the good to them that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So we've got to understand that that's a true word for us. Then we can go through those things with victory. But we, oh man, we whine and complain about the least little things. Can I get a witness? Don't we do that? Oh, God, deliver me from my neighbor. He throws beer bottles in my yard. He looked at me funny the other day when I got, he said, where are you going? I'm going to church. Oh, man, he looked at me funny. God, I don't know. What can I do about my neighbor? Well, God would say, go and get him saved. Love him. But we just get upset over the least things. All things stripped of their garments, beaten with rods on their bare backs. All things thrown into prison. Their feet bound and chained. All for doing a good thing. A good thing. Setting a young lady free. Maybe you feel like you're in a prison right now. Maybe you feel like you're in a prison right now. Not a physical prison. Although I know people right now that are in physical prisons. But maybe you feel like you're in a prison. In your marriage, in your job, your finances, family situations. You're going through some things. And that's what this is about. It's, it's not so you can hear a really good story about a man that was a brave man of God, two men of God. It's about where are you at right now? What's, what's, what prison are you in? What situation are you in? What circumstance are you going in that you can say, hey, God, I know all things work together for the good. All this that I'm going through, I know they work together for the good. Because I love you, and I've been called according to your purpose. What is our usual response when things like this would happen? What would be your response if you got arrested today for being a Christian? And you got thrown into jail, county jail down here. What would be your response? Give me a lawyer! Get me out of here! Instead of, okay, God, what have you got for me down at the, at the jail? Who have you got down there for me to witness to? Who have you got down there for me to save? Huh? Amen? Some of y'all are like, I don't get this. You, you see, I, we for too long as Christians, we take scriptures and we say, we quote them and we think they're nice little and neat little scriptures and yet we don't apply them to our life. And we're going through stuff and we don't understand that all this is going to work out for his, for his glory, for your good. Number three. It's two P's, number three. Prayer and praise. Verse 25. Paul and Silas, undaunted. You know what undaunted means? 
not intimidated by danger or disappointment. Paul and Silas, undaunted. Were you going to look it up for me? Seriously? Way to go, Pam. Paul and Silas, undaunted, prayed in the middle of the night and sang songs of praise to God while all the other prisoners listened to their worship. It sounds good, doesn't it? It just sounds good. I mean, these guys are so awesome. But they're bleeding. They're bleeding. They're hurting. They're not in a comfortable position. They're, they might have been raising their hands because they were chained. You know, some of you, you won't raise your hand. Maybe you, you need to be chained up so your hands will be raised to the Lord. I don't know. I don't know. That just It's embarrassing. Undaunted, prayed in the middle of the night. I can understand that part. Can't you? Oh, God, get me out of here. Help me, Lord. I, we didn't do anything wrong. We just helped a little girl out. And, and Lord, we didn't mean to. We just tried to get a demon out of her. And Lord, just get us out of here. I can understand the praying part. But the singing praises part? Can you understand that one? See, all of you, all the Christian people, all, all the religious people, oh yeah, I sing all the time when things are going bad. No, you don't. You're lying. Just had a car wreck. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I just had a wreck. I got my car total. It's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No. But see, he understood all things work together for the good. To them to love Him and to call according to His purpose. They understood that. So they would, okay God, we're here. We, we're going to lift Your name up. We've got an audience. We've got a captive audience here, Lord. They didn't want to listen to us out there on the, on the town square. But we've got guys all around us. They're not going anywhere. That's what a preacher likes to hear. See, y'all are, are right. You're a captive audience. I got you right here. And if you start wandering out, we got security out there to bring you back. So I, Paul's going, man, this is a good opportunity. Silas, these, these guys are all lost. They're in the worst of the worst place. They're not thinking about themselves. We're here, but hey, look, I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach the message. I'm gonna, let's, sing, let's sing some hymns. Amazing. Can you imagine the rest of the preachers going, what in the world is going on with these guys? Are these idiots? What are they? Then they begin to see this peace upon them. You know, I talked a few weeks ago about how God, uh, the Bible says that we can see faith. I believe that they could see faith on these guys. I think they could see something. They might have been glowing a little bit. I don't know, but they're looking at Paul and Silas and saying, man, these guys, why aren't they mad? Why aren't they, they just been beat with rods. Why weren't they upset? Well, who are they praying to anyway? And who are they singing about? See, they had a captive audience. And Paul wasn't going to miss an opportunity. He wasn't going to miss an opportunity. You see, when, when you're in the midst of something in your life and it looks like everything's falling apart, the best thing you can do is prayer and praise. That's the best thing you can do. Praise Him. Get on your knees. Praise Him on your knees. Praise Him. Stand Him up. Lift your hands. Praise Him in the midst of the storm. I believe that prayer builds our faith, and I, pre I believe that praise releases our faith. I, I tell you, for me and for, for my wife, when we stepped into, uh, um, we called it contemporary worship, okay? Remember, remember the big battle? Hymns are a contemporary worship. Old songs are cool songs, right? And so there was a big debate, and churches split over that. Can you imagine? We're going to split over praising Jesus, <laughs> You want to sing that way, and we want to sing this way. Well, you just go over there and sing. We're going to go over there. That's what happened. Churches split over it. Amazing. But I remember when we stepped into singing to God instead of singing about God, all of a sudden our praise, our, our faith level began to rise. And, and I believe, I, I, I read this book. I went to this worship conference in Canada, and this guy wrote this book called Praise Releases Faith. And I, I read that book, and I said, you're right, man. The more we praise him, the more our faith level rises. And so they're in this prison, and they're praying, and then they're singing praises to God, and their faith level is rising. You know why? Because their eyes are not on their situation anymore. They're not, they're not thinking about their bloody backs and the pain that they're going through. They're not thinking about what they're going to do tomorrow. They're thinking about what are we going to do right now to give glory to God. Let's sing it. Let's praise him let's pray 
And people are like, oh my goodness, who are these guys? Woo! Let me fire you up. Look, look, what, well, look what Paul said in Acts 20, 24. But whether I live or die is not important, but I, for I don't esteem my life as indispensable. It's more important for me to fulfill my destiny and to finish the, my minist the ministry my Lord Jesus has assigned to me, which is to faithfully preach the wonderful news of God's grace. He said, I don't care if they kill me. Through, throughout Scripture, Paul would say, I, my life is not dear to me. Yeah, I, listen, I don't count my life dear to me. If I, if I die, I go to heaven. If I live, I'm just going to stay here and preach the gospel. What, what an attitude. All things work together for the good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. He understood that. He believed it with all his heart. See, sometimes our prayers are more like whining and begging instead of prayers of agreement and prayers of faith in our situations. We sing, I will praise Him in the storm, but do we praise Him in the storm? We sing, oh, there is another in the fire. Do you really believe there's another in the fire with you? Or, it is well, it is well with my soul. And then the next thing you do is whine and complain about what's going on in your life. But, oh, it is. See, we might sing these songs. It's like we might quote these scriptures, but do we live them? Do we believe them? When Paul taught about putting the armor of God on in Ephesians 6, you know, you know that scripture. Praying always. After you put on the armor, he says, praying always. We talked about this last week. With all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end. With all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me. You know, I ask you, pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our pastors. Pray for our elders. That utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly. You see, there may be a day come, it won't be just Facebook saying you can't say that. It will be the government saying you can't say that. Will I be bold enough to say the things that God has put on my heart to say, to speak the truth in love? But see, a lot of people, oh, that's never going to happen. Well, I used to think that's never going to happen, but I don't think that anymore. Do you think that way anymore as our thinking changed and what's happening in our world? So you better be praying for leaders, be praying for pastors, be praying that people will not cow down to the government or whatever the entity is that says you can't say the truth, you can't speak the truth. He says, for which I am ambassador, I'm an ambassador in change. Exactly what he was when we're reading Acts ch chapter 16. He was an ambassador in chains. You're an ambassador wherever you go. You're a good one or you're a bad one. You're showing somebody something by the way you live your life. And I pray that you're showing them Jesus Christ. The last thing I want us to see is purpose. Four-point sermon. That's kind of rare for me. You're usually seven or eight or ten points. Verse uh, 26. Suddenly a great earthquake shook the foundations of the prison. All at once every prison door flung open and the chains of all the prisoners came loose and startled the jailer awoke and saw every cell door standing open. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, you know the Bible, I mean not the Bible, but we're told never to assume anything. I'm so glad he was caught. He didn't follow through. Okay? Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. That's a rough job to have. Just saying, right? Somebody gets away, I'm dead, right? When Paul shouted in the darkness, Stop! Don't hurt yourself! We're all still here! The jailer called for a light, and when he saw that they were still in their cells, he rushed in and fell trembling at their feet. Now, whose feet do you think he went and fell at? All the rest of the prisoners? Ah, Paul and Silas's. They were making a difference in the prison. See, when, when you're making a difference out there, and some turmoil happens, at your workplace and a 911 happens, they ought to be coming to you, not to the world, because they've seen your faith, they've heard your prayers, they've seen your life, they know your character. Then he led Paul and Silas outside and asked, What must I do to be saved? Wow. They answered, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and all your family. 
Then they prophesied the word of the Lord over him and all of his family. Even though the hour was late, he washed their wounds. Then he and all of his family were baptized. And he took Paul and Silas into his home and set them on at his table and fed them. And then the jailer and all his family were filled with joy in their newfound faith in God. In the midst of an earthquake, eternal life shows up. You see, Paul didn't leave. Peter got out because the, 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 the angel said, let's go. We've got to get out of here. God had a different plan for Peter. But for Paul, he said, no, you, apparently the Holy Spirit said, Paul, you stay right here. You're here for a purpose. Yeah. See, you're, you're where you're at this morning for a purpose, Melissa. God's just not random. God's not a random God. He's got your life mapped out. He's got a book. He's writing about your, about your life. And he's got, you, he's got your purpose. He's got your destiny. He's got it mapped out for you. You see, our, our, our thing is we want to run our destiny. We want to do our purpose. And God says, no, you need to get your purpose lined up with my purpose, the divine purpose. And that's the purpose that's destined for you from the day you're born to the day you die. He's got a destiny for you. Say, he's got a destiny for me. Jeremiah 29, 11. We love to quote this verse. It's in probably some of you have it framed in your, in your, in your, uh, in your house or in your den or somewhere. It says, For I know the thoughts or the plans. A lot of you like the NIV. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? He's talking about purpose in your life. And listen, if you go ahead, go ahead and read the rest, read, read the rest of it in the context. He says, But you're going to be slave. You're going to be enslaved for 70 years. Hallelujah. Doesn't that sound good? So you've got to be doing some things in the in-between. I, re I read a book last week by uh, Glenn Berto. It's a really good book. Uh, the, why, I don't, why people don't get healed. But one, one of the things he talked about in the book was the in-between time. Anybody know what the in-between time is? You prayed and you're waiting, you're believing for your healing, but it hasn't come yet, so you're in the in-between time. Or you've got kids and they've wandered away from the Lord and you're calling your prodigals home, so you're in the in-between time before they come back. Or you're going through issues in your life and you're in the in-between time. What do you do in the in-between time? You pray and you praise and you praise and you, you, pray and you intercede and you, you lift up the name of Jesus and you acknowledge that He's in the midst of your struggle and that He's gonna, He is for you, He's not against you. That's what you do in the in-between time. Until you see it happen. Seventy years in bondage. Joseph going to prison. How many years was he in prison? Thirteen years. Abraham and Sarah, you know that ten years between the day that he said, you're going to have a baby boy. Well, she's already eighty. <laughs> going to wait ten more years? How, how's that going to work, Lord? The in-between time. What are you doing in the in-between time? Are you worshiping God? Are you serving Him? All through Scripture we see great men and women go through some horrible things. Some challenging things. And I don't know what you're going through this morning. How many of you are going through something difficult? Come on, raise your hands. Be, be honest, because it should be most of you. There's something going on. And maybe you can't even see a way out of it. Would you go with me to these three men that... There's a king, and he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, he said, That's when, the, when, the, when the music plays, you just bow down and worship me, and everything will be good. Worship this king. And there's these three guys. Their names were cool names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Shad, me, and bed. <laughs> I'm just, I don't know if I could call my son Shadrach. I'd just call him Shad. They were said, listen, if you guys would just, you know, bow down and worship me, everything's good. You won't lose your life. You won't be thrown into the fire. And they were going like, I don't know. You know, we serve the living God. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's told us not to bow down to any idols, especially not a king, an earthly king. Goodness gracious, no, we can't do that. And I, I know the king, he liked these guys. You know, he did. He liked them. He didn't want to have to throw them in the fire, but he said, guys, I don't, my back's against the wall. I made a decree, so I've got to, if I don't come through with this, the people are going to think I'm just a wishy-washy king. I'm a liar. So it says, if you'll do, I'm going to give you one more chance. This is what they said. Daniel 3.16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We've already made up our minds. See, they already made up their minds. Paul's already made up his mind. All things work together for the good. To them that love the Lord, called according to his purpose. 
I already made up my mind. So you need to make up your mind. And when you go through these situations, they won't, you can't go through undaunted, okay? If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. He can do that, right? And He will deliver us from your hand, O King, but if not, I love this, but if not, let it be known to you, O King, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. How many of you can have this kind of attitude? If, it's, if it works out, great. If it doesn't work out, great. We like it to work out, don't we? We always like the good ending. We like the, the good ending to the story. And they live happily ever after. Not everybody in the Bible lived happily ever after. Read Hebrews 11. Some were sawn in two. Some were beheaded. We like to read the good stories, but there's some other ones that aren't so happy endings. And yet they were like, we've got a home that's not here. See, God sees the ending from the beginning. We don't. He sees the ending of what you're going through from the beginning and what started it. Whether it was a good or bad beginning, He knows the ending for it. You need to partner with God that the ending is going to be according to His will according to His plan and not yours. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned it for good, for their good and for God's glory when He said, hey, I know you're going to get beaten. I know you're going to go to jail. But there's a jailer and his family that need to be saved. There's a jailer and his family that need to be saved and I've planned it just all out. If you will be faithful, Paul, Silas, if you will be faithful, Listen, they're going to come into the kingdom of God and they're going to affect thousands of people. We don't know how many people he affected. That jailer and his family, we don't know. See, you don't know how many people you will affect when you stand true and faithful to God no matter what you're going through. Would you stand this morning? So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are His lovers who have been called to fulfill His design purpose. Are you fulfilling God's purpose? It's a surrender. It's a submission. It's a recognizing that He knows more than you know. That He's smarter than you. So quit arguing with God. Quit fighting against His will. Say, God, whatever. I'm yours. Take me. Use me. I'm, I am clay in your hands. Can I have a mystery team come?